Well, today we continue on with the sermon series, um, Find Out What Pleases God. And tonight we're going to talk about using our spiritual gifts. But if you're up to no good, if you're trying to scam someone, if you're a terrorist, you better watch out for Nora. Now, Nora's not the latest femme fatale of some spy business. She's not the latest incarnation of Emma Peel or Nikita. No, Aunt Nora stands for non-obvious relationship awareness. Nora is a super sophisticated computer program that does database mining, trying to find out relationships that on the surface don't seem to be there. It was invented by a high school dropout, self-taught hacker named Jeff Jonas. Now, he initially created this program for the gambling industry, you know, trying to catch casino cheats. For example, you know, Nora might uh, alert security at Mandalay Bay, telling them that the guy who's winning big on the blackjack table once had the same phone number as the table dealer. Now, it might not be anything at all. It might be just a mere coincidence, but it warrants further investigation. If you're an employer, you might be interested in Nora because it can reveal to you employees who have the same address as a previous employee that you had fired or tell you of an employee who's, uh, who had, is related to a slip and fall victim who sued the company in the past. Nora can do four really big things for you. It can tell you who is who. It identifies people, organizations, and things as they really are. It can tell you who knows who. It identifies the relationships between people, organizations, and things. It can tell you what's in a name. It recognizes customers, clients and criminals across a variety of cultural nuances of a name. And it can do so legally without bumping up against any data protection or civil liberty laws. But now, suppose we apply Nora, the non-obvious relationship program, to the church. You know, this program could be really helpful to a pastor in a new congregation because it could tell him who is related to whom so that he doesn't end up with foot-in-mouth syndrome. Those of you who are new to Ascension, let me tell you something. They're all related. (laughs) Don't say anything. No. What I really want to talk about this evening is how non-obvious relationships, in fact, are an essential part of the church. And St. Paul makes that point by looking at the spiritual gifts that God has given to his church. Paul was quite aware that not all the Corinthian Christians had the same spiritual gift. And he says that's the way God intended it to be. We know from our wider context of 1 Corinthians that some people, though, within the Corinthian church thought that their spiritual gift was more dramatic and more public than the others, and so they thought their gift was superior to others in the church. Some acted as if they were in the finals of The Voice. These gifts, or their gifts, were so different from the rest that They couldn't see the connection between their public dramatic gifts and the gifts of others who were not so public or dramatic. So St. Paul in our text doesn't really emphasize the diversity of gifts, but the unifying, non-obvious relationship between 
the gifts. And that's what I want to emphasize today as well. Because most of the time we think about the individual gifts. We look at and pick them apart. You know, identifying, well, which one do I have? And don't look at the unity, the totality of gifts that God has given to his kingdom. We pick apart, like I said, these gifts trying to identify which one that I have or which one is needed. You know, like, okay, he's an oak, he, they're maples, well, I'm just a shrub, and oh, she's a flowering pear. We pick apart them and see the trees and don't see the forest that God has given to us. We focus on our individual gifts and forget to celebrate the unity of the gifts that God has given to us. So St. Paul is clear. The church needs all the gifts, and none are superior or inferior to the others. This is just as true for Ascension today as it was for the church at Corinth. Oh, some gifts might seem lowlier, but in the Spirit's scale, they're all weighty, and they're all critical to the church. That attitude is what St. Paul says we should have as fully formed followers of Jesus. The attitude of none superior, none inferior. It's mutual service and mutual sacrifice. And that attitude, says St. Paul, pleases God. How do we know? because of what he says in those verses 4 through 7. Now, these are, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. You know, that could be the descriptive um, copy on the packaging of the church's Nora program. And the church at Corinth sure needed that software in their um, first century computers. What Paul wanted his readers to understand was there is a relationship between each of the gifts that God, that God gives the members of his congregation, of his church, that makes the church better, more than just the sum of its parts. These non-obvious connections between the gifts make the whole the message rather than the little parts of the message. Think of it this way. A congregation can have a gifted preacher who delivers moving and powerful sermons and presents the gospel in eloquent, compelling language that move people to join that congregation. Wouldn't be nice if Ascension had one of those. But if the woman who has the gift of, of hospitality, the one who sets up the coffee and the donuts in the morning would decide one time, well, I'm tired of doing this. I'm just not going to do it any longer. Then something critical is lost in that congregation, and the message <laughs> is diminished. The same is true as if members with the gift of prayer don't pray. Or members with some other gifts say, not me. Every time a child is baptized here at Ascension, a question is asked the congregation, which essentially says, will you nurture the newly baptized in the Christian faith Will you watch over this child in Christian care? And the congregation always answers, yes, with the help of God. But unless all of you 
exercise your spiritual gifts, that's an empty promise. As a pastor, as professional staff, we only have a limited role. We can pray for them. We can tell them about simple truths around a children's sermon. When they're older, we can teach them something about the church and Christian teachings and what the Bible says. They may, may be a few other opportunities. But aside from those brief contexts, context, spiritual nurturing will be done or will not be done by the church members. Of course, the parents play a key role in this, but within the church, it will be the members who will make the biggest impact on that child, the loving nursery worker, the dedicated Sunday school teacher, and we need some Sunday school teachers here at Ascension, the youth worker, the Bible school volunteers, individual members who praise a child for their participation in the Christmas program, or when they sing a solo in the church, or give them some other praise for a milestone they've reached in their lives. Is all of that obvious at the time of baptism? Probably not. But it's precisely those non-obvious connections that make the church strong. These non-obvious connections happen because of one very obvious connection that we have. The most obvious connection that we have is the gift of faith. This is one gift that all of us share. This one spiritual gift is what binds us together. With this gift, whether we agree with one another all the time or not, we are still brothers and sisters in Christ. Every one of us has been given the gift of faith in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's this fundamental gift that holds together the church, the body of Christ. This gift of faith receives, apprehends, and knows the grace and mercy our God has freely given us in the, in, through the sacrifice of his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. God's love and mercy for us is received with that gift. But God doesn't just give us the gift of faith. He gives us other gifts as well. And no two people have exactly the same set of gifts. We need those other gifts in God's kingdom. He commands us to employ those gifts that he has given us in his kingdom for the sake of our neighbor, for the glory of his kingdom. Whatever gift or gifts that he has given to you, they are absolutely needed for the sake of the unity of the kingdom of God. Fully formed followers of Jesus please God when they use these gifts and talents for the honor of God and for the sake of our neighbor. Here's one more powerful example. There was once a large Lutheran church in downtown Detroit, but the downtown area had hit on hard times. The downtown area was decaying, and security for the building became quite an issue. Security measures were taken, and one of those measures were putting deadbolts on the door, you know, the kind that you needed a key to unlock even from the inside of the building. Well, one morning the custodian came by and noticed that the window of the kitchen had been broken out. It seems broken out from the inside. They called the police, and later that day an officer came by and said that he had talked to a boy just the evening before about a 12-year-old who was acting suspiciously around the church building. 
when he had heard about the window being broken out, he went and talked to the boy again, and the boy admitted that he was the one who broke the window. He said he had slipped in through the one door by the church office that was unlocked and was inside the church building when they had locked it. And the only way that he could get out was by breaking the window in the kitchen since all the doors needed a key even from the inside to get out. Well, when some of the parishioners heard about this, they said, well, let's press charges. But one woman in there asked the officer some questions about the boy's background. He was from a poor family. He had no father at home. He, the, he, is, he had never been in trouble with the law before. He had not stolen anything from the church that they knew. And the woman theorized that he was probably in the kitchen trying to find some food. So she persuaded the people to act as a church first and said, don't press charges, give me time to find a solution. Well, at Sunday school that Sunday, She got her class together and asked if they would contribute enough to buy a membership at the local YMCA so that the boy would have something, some positive place to go in his free time. And then she asked some of the people in the congregation if they'd contact the mother and see if that mother needed food instead. Now, how many sermons do you suppose the people of that congregation heard over the past number of years about compassion and mercy and loving one's neighbors probably plenty but it took a woman with the gift of compassion to make the connection between the words of the sermon and a stranger who was locked inside their church It's natural for us to focus on our gifts, on our contributions to the life of the church. But if we fail to appreciate the non-obvious relationships, the web, the matrix that truly empowers the church, the body of Christ, then the church becomes, as St. Paul says, a disabled body. God has given spiritual gifts to each of us. First and foremost, the gift of faith. All gifts, according to St. Paul, are to be used for the common good. It may not be obvious to you right now how those gifts fit in with ascension here. You may be thinking, ah, ascension doesn't even need my gifts. They don't ask me to serve anyway. But... The non-obvious relationships between the gifts of ascension, which is you all, and the full functioning of ascension cannot be ignored. We need each other. When you're aware of Nora in the church, then, as St. Paul says, you will see dissension diminish, and love increase. And isn't that what we all want? And now may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.